and I request protocol to escort His Excellency. The Assembly will, he will now hear an, addr an address by His Excellency James Marape, Prime Minister of the Independent State of Papua New Guinea. I request protocol to escort His Excellency. I have great pleasure in welcoming His Excellency James Marape, Prime Minister of the Independent State of Papua New Guinea. I invite him to address the Assembly. His Excellency, Mr. Sabah Korosi, the President of our General Assembly, his Excellency, Mr. Antonio Guterres, Secretary General of the United Nations. Distinguished fellow heads of government and heads of state, ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor and privilege to again join and address this August Hall. On my government and people's behalf, I congratulate you, Mr. President, and the government and people of Hungary on your election to preside over the new term of the General Assembly's work and wish you all the very best. Mr. President, your presidency's theme of an integrated agenda for peace and prosperity and sustainability through multilateralism is most needed today. We must build on the good foundations laid by your predecessors and all of us going forward. This is given the turmoil, uncertainty, mistrust, pain, suffering from multiple crises, including the COVID-19 pandemic, the worsening climate crisis, the escalating social economic challenges, and conflicts that are tearing us apart. Let us transform words into actions. This must be underpinned by our collective commitments supportive resources that are affordable, accessible, and timely, and with enhanced opportunities that will assist us all to provide our people's basic needs, restore their trust and confidence in all our governments, heal our lands and ecosystems to deliver the future we want as envisioned by the 2030 Agenda and many of our own development aspirations. Mr. President, let me pay tribute to your predecessor, a fellow small island developing state representative, His Excellency Mr. Abdullah Saeed of Maldives, for his outstanding presidency of hope that has renewed our collective resolve to turn the tide against the ravages of the pandemic and other evolving challenges. We wish him all the very best. May I also convey my delegation's gratitude to Mr. Secretary General for his strong, continued leadership and the untiring efforts in rallying the world to save ourselves and provide a future that is much better, safer, and secure for all, including, most importantly, our succeeding generations. The candid yet sobering report presented by the Secretary General to us at this meeting on the state of our world today is deeply troubling. The clarion call from the Secretary General must not go unheeded. We must all do our part and act decisively now for our collective good. Otherwise, the alternative is to condemn ourselves to a future of doom and gloom. Is that what our children deserve? It is with this in mind that Papua New Guinea is supportive of the Secretary General's narrative of our common agenda. We welcome the preliminary progress made to better understand the range of defining issues and how we address this effectively to help deliver on the SDGs promise to improve our people's life and livelihoods whilst also protecting common environment for the better tomorrow. To this end, we applaud the Secretary General for convening the Transforming Education Summit. We are pleased to note the shared recognition of education as a cornerstone for a prosperous, stable, and secure future for all. I know that an educated society is an informed society 
that stands to make better decisions. For my country, Mr. President, education is a key priority and is guided by our education policy of leaving no child behind, supported by our education sector's development plan 2023 to 2027. It is a holistic and inclusive approach in ensuring focus on quality, lifelong education for all, with special attention given to the most vulnerable and marginalized population, recognizing the importance of multi-stakeholder in the education pursuit. A demonstration of this strong commitment for education is my government's decision to provide free education for all, up to grade 12 and beyond into tertiary educations, and also providing opportunities to children, youth, and adults through flexible, open, and distant education, and community colleges to upskill their capacity to be entrepreneurs and nation builders. Mr. President, we also welcome the consensus to reach the Summit of the Future that is scheduled for September 2024 to find solutions to the multiple crises we are now facing on planet Earth. This should, however, be not defined by the lowest common denominator, but in my view, it must be rather more ambitious, at the same time, realistic and workable. We remain committed to engage in this process because it provides an opportunity for us to also draw parallels with our own national efforts to attain our national vision 2050. Mr. President, I am pleased to inform this assembly that the COVID-19 pandemic and every other stresses that we face as a nation, including the supply chain difficulties and development finance challenges affecting my country, has spared my government to embark on our own similar national process to the General Secretary's, Secretary General's rather global efforts under our common agenda. This is where we have taken stock of our own domestic development challenges and we have set in place key policies and legislative measures, including reforms in important sectors and our development priorities, tying them to a budget cycle under what we call the medium-term development plan. This path, if we work upon it, will make Papua New Guinea a middle-income earning nation by 2050, as envisioned by our own nation's recent 2050 aspirations. Mr. President, I report to the United Nations that the core focus of my government for the next five years, because we won and, seek and, and received mandate in the recently concluded democratic election process, will be to build a resilient and diversified economy, invest in high quality economic and social infrastructures, ensure fair and equitable natural resources development, address business and investment confidences, strengthening the rule of law and domestic security, deliver quality education and health to all our people, and lastly but not the least, strengthening the institutions of state, including governance on key issues like corruption and everything that is, uh, is fundamental to developing nations. These are fundamental building blocks of my country that should contribute towards peace and prosperity and sustainable development as proposed by yourself, Mr. President. Mr. President, as Papua New Guinea approaches our 50th independence anniversary in three years' time, my government is also prioritizing industrializing our economy through import substitution, value-adding, and downstream processing of our vast natural resources with the use of modern, clean, green technology that will not compromise my country's rich biodiversity and our pristine natural environment. For it is believed Papua New Guinea, and it is documented rather, Papua New Guinea has about five to six percent of world's biodiversity and our huge tropical rainforest, third only behind Congo and Amazon areas of our planet. We therefore welcome genuine and appropriate foreign investors to jo join us in partnership in various sectors of our renewable resources development and I assure them of a fair, equitable, and secure returns on their investments. Mr. President, while we note the global community's call for domestic revenue sources to be expanded and better harnessed for development financing, we also recognize that the existing global economic and financial architecture is weighed against developing countries like myself or Papua New Guinea. This structure needs to be changed to the better so that it supports all developing nations 
in their developing needs. Least we forget, and I say least we forget, many times small developing countries get to bear the brunt of global economic and social wars that they have no hand in engendering those global issues. It is in this spirit I also join the calls of a fellow small island developing state for the development financing needs to be considered by taking into account the environmental, economic, and social dimensions, dimensions of the vulnerability rather than the gross national income measure alone, which is no longer suitable to them. We therefore ask the international community to support the proposed SID as multi-vulnerability index as a tool to support small island developing states concessional financing and debt relief given the special circumstances amidst the ongoing and increasing challenges they continue to face in as far as their development needs are concerned, including food securities that our good General Secretary alluded to. Mr. President, today in many parts of the world, we're facing food security as you alluded to. Hunger and poverty can be something that Papua New Guinea can assist contribute to alleviating in as far as our global contribution is concerned. Papua New Guinea's 8 million people live in a landmass of 464,840 square kilometers of land. Our country has rain and water with abundance of sea equally as a food source. We are presently supplying, for instance, tuna to Asia and Europe. Comparing, for instance, United Kingdom of Great Britain has only 243,610 square kilometers. Japan has 377,975 square kilometers. Or our neighbor, Philippines, has only 300,000 square kilometers of land. Papua New Guinea has enough land, sea, and people to be a food supplier to the world, Mr. Secretary General, in response to your concerns for global food security. For the first time in our country, my government has inserted efforts to address this imminent problem by placing more emphasis on the agricultural sector. This is viewed not only as a revenue source for our economy, but also a conduit to empower the majority of our rural communities through introduction of innovative farming methods in cash crop production, livestock, and poultry, and to take ownership and leadership of their development needs and livelihoods, and at the same time also foster poverty alleviation and food security. It is from this perspective that we have established a new ministerial, new ministerial portfolios for oil palm, for coffee, and for livestock that will assist us cater better, not only for the needs of majority of our rural communities and the local economies to be integrated into the national and global markets, but to also to improve their lives and livelihood to be a source for food security and hunger and poverty alleviation for our own country as well as export to other countries. We therefore welcome new international development partners to work with us in the agricultural sector, particularly in the downstream processing of products that adds value and supports local communities and our country. Mr. President, on climate change, as the world prepares for COP27, despite the rallying efforts of global communities, including pledges under the Paris Agreement to cut emissions level, the world still remains on fire, Mr. President. This is further compounded by destructive floods and rising sea levels. And let me pass Papua New Guinea's sympathies to the victims of the flood in, 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 uh, in Pakistan. These effects on our coastal communities include displacement of many and loss of identity as a people and in one country and across the Pacific region and beyond the carbon emission level continues to cause destruction and the destructive spiral is getting out of control. We cannot and must not allow this to continue, Mr. President. And I again reiterate my call I made last year to this August Hall. My country, as one of the largest standing pristine tropical rainforests of the world, is one of the few if I could repeat, one of the few carbon-positive countries of the world. We remove more carbon than we emit. Over the past five years or so, we have reduced our national forest emission by 
This totals over 75 million tons of United Nations verified read class credits that will be on the market by the end of this year. My government has adopted our Climate Management Act, and this year we have set in place our nationally determined contribution regulation. We now have the legis legislation needed to implement the Paris Agreement. We have also endorsed our nationally determined contributions implementation plan and the NDC Electricity Roadmap and the Agriculture, Forestry and other land use NCD roadmaps. We are also drafting our first electric vehicle policy and working towards endorsing our national adaptation plan. It is, however, despite small countries like Papua New Guinea who don't have many or big carbon footprints. It is, however, disheartening to note that despite our proactive national efforts to implement our Paris Agreement commitment, we seem to be getting the raw end of the deal all the time. We have done our part. We have had little support from the Global North, including our submissions to the Green Climate Fund. We have not, however, lost all hope, despite the fact that the Reed Plus and the Forest Nations were almost forgotten in the Glasgow conversations. We cannot be placated by toothless pledges anymore. We need the power of sovereign carbon markets that fully comply with the Paris Agreement. The world cannot talk about climate change without talking about forest conservations and proper land use management. Papua New Guinea is calling now for an urgent global focus on conservation, preservation, and sustainability of our global forests with proper land use practices because only in our dear threes, only in our dear threes of the forest that you find the dual benefit of carbon cleansing and oxygen production. Excellencies, I was given a rare privilege of meeting His Majesty King Charles III, where his views said with me on forest is the same as I am mentioning here today, and that the world, especially those whose carbon footprints of a mother earth is the greatest, must help preserve the forest of the earth that commensurates the levels of emissions. This is incumbent upon all nations. We must preserve our forests. It is Papua New Guinea's humble view that the atmospheric balance of oxygen and carbon should be ranked the number one focus of all mankind because therein lies the sustenance of life and the dear trees of our forests place this balancing act as created by Creator God. The world must save our forests because to not to do so is suicidal and is suicidal for the Earth's future. We are living a gloomy future for our children. This is something we must correct at COP27 in some else sake. This must be corrected. Lest, let us not forget that there is more carbon stored in the world's forests than held in the known coal, oil, and gas reserves. In short, if we lose our rainforests, climate stability is impossible. We may as well kiss the temperature goal of 1.5 degrees goodbye. We and the other rainforest nations are trying our best to balance forest harvest for our development needs, at the same time conserving for the world need. We need help here. You have to hear us. Our planet is fragile. Time is short. Together, we can do it. For not to do so is to the detriment of planet Earth. And on my final point on climate change, given the increasing adverse impact of climate change on our communities, I would also like to echo Papua New Guinea's strong support for our Melanesian neighbor Vanuatu's initiative to seek International Court of Just Justice advisory opinion on the existential trade and welcome others to join the Pacific and Caribbean and other partners to take this forward in this General Assembly for our common good. On the ocean agenda, Mr. President, I would reaffirm that Papua New Guinea as a maritime nation is strongly committed to ensuring our maritime zones remain safe, secure, and peaceful under the spirit of the United Nations Con Convention on the Law of the Seas. If not only provides us, it not only provides us economic opportunities, I beg your pardon, but also includes through our fisheries resources, but also symbolizes our ties with the ocean as we've been for many, many centuries. Like other small island developing states and least developing, developed countries, Papua New Guinea calls on developed nations to assist us access appropriate capacity building resources, research, 
science and technology and finance to strengthen our national efforts to protect our ocean and harness ocean-based economy. We therefore welcome public-private partnerships. On SDG 14, it was pleasing to note the success of the second ocean conference. Mr. President, we also encourage by the welcome offer by France and Costa Rica to be the next co-host of the conference and look forward to working with like-minded countries to take forward this initiative. Such partnerships on the ocean agenda is most welcome. Mr. President, I would like to also applaud the sterling efforts under the leadership and presidency of Singapore for last month's negotiation related to the new implementing instrument on the conservation and sustainable use of marine biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction. As a marine nation, we offer our fullest support. Mr. President, a resounding call we continue to hear loud and clear and repeatedly and rightfully so is the importance of empowering youth to be at the table of decision making about their lives and livelihoods and as a real partner for national development. This is indeed long overdue, must be brought to fruition without further delay. In recognition of the ever-increasing youth bulks in my country and the challenges they continue to face, under my government we have put development priorities and have brought youth issues to the, to the forefront and center of our nation building. We are rolling out currency programs as a tool for capacity building and training that will equip them to be owners, drivers, and leaders and entrepreneurs to build our nation. And we are also using our education system as a lever to foster integral human development for all our youths. And we welcome development partners to join us in these transformative endeavors. Mr. President, it is in this spirit that Papua New Guinea was pleased to be a main sponsor and strong supporter of the establishment of a youth office in the United Nations Secretariat. It was also pleasing to note the consensus on this issue. Whilst we recognize that much work remains to be done, however, once op operationalized, we look forward to harnessing the United Nations Youth Office to support our national efforts on the youth agenda. The potential of our youth, as well as recognition by Her Excellency Amina Mohammed, the United Nations Deputy Secretary General, and the Youth Special Envoy during their groundbreaking visit to my country in March 2020 is a testament to this partnership. Mr. President, on gender equality and empowerment, including combating gender-based violence, this remains a top priority for my government. We have established a bipartisan parliamentary committee that has done extensive public consultations, and the recommendations made to the last parliament will be taken up by this parliament in a serious way to address the protection of our women and girls and give them fair and just opportunities to reach all their full potentials. We have also put in place legislations and policy to address concerns to gender equality, empowerment, and combat gender-based violences. Additionally, we are pleased to have two well-qualified women elected into parliament in our recently concluded election for 11th parliament. An improvement from our last parliament where there were no women in parliament. I've also recognized their capabilities and their professionalism, and we have tasked them with certain responsibilities for our country. We will continue, continue to work hard to have more women representatives in decision-making bodies as equal development partners. Mr. President, I would like to join the call for global peace and stability. The simmering tensions and mistrust, which are the nemesis of peace, cannot and must not be allowed to fester anymore. We, as members of this United Nations, took it upon ourselves to uphold the Charter of the United Nations. It is therefore incumbent upon all of us to ensure that we are seen to uphold the commitments of the United Nations Charter. In our context of peace, the Bougainville peace process is continuing, and I want to assure this August Forum, and I want to assure the United Nations in this meeting that this important issue remains a top priority in Papua New Guinea. Peace by peaceful means means this is a very important national priority for my government, and I'd like to say we are on a road to ha having a political solution uh, settled for Bougainville. We have a roadmap that continues to serve as a blueprint, and we will consider all issues under the existing parameters of our constitution for a lasting and peaceful political solution that is acceptable to all Papua New Guineans in as far as 
Bougainville is concerned. We would like to place our big thank you to the United Nations for their role in Papua New Guinea and the Melanesian conflict resolution that they have come to know can be replicated in other areas in and around uh, the region and on planet Earth in as far as those that face political conflicts are concerned. On the reforms of the Security Council, Mr. President, to make it relevant today, it is a task we must attend to. And we note the incremental progress that continues to be made into intergovernmental progresses, processes rather. However, let me again reiterate our call to expedite the long drawn out process by ensuring that we have a negating document that can serve as a basis for all of us to go forward. May I also take this opportunity to recognize the milestone achievement. Earlier this year, the General Assembly uh, held the members of the Security Council responsible for the decisions regarding peace and security. This is welcomed, and we support the emergency special session measures invoked under the General Assembly with respect to the situation in Ukraine and to ensure the Security Council is really accountable for all the actions. The success that arose from this process is a small but nonetheless significant step to why the reform of the Security Council is necessary and cannot be prolonged any further. In closing, and not the least, Mr. President, may I take this opportunity to pay homage to the memory of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, who, by the grace of God and Lord Jesus, was Papua New Guinea's head of state for the last 47 years. Our beloved Queen personified grace, dignity, honesty, humility, tolerance of others, forgiveness, and all the other Christian virtues, and lived 70 years of consistent, unfailing life of public service. Some lessons we leaders of the world today must learn to practice. And I, and on behalf of my Papua New Guinea, Pay our respects to Mama Queen, as we affectionately call her. May her soul rest in peace with the Maker Jesus. And we say our heartfelt sympathies and condolences to His Majesty King Charles III and his royal family and the people and the government of the United Kingdom and the Commonwealth family. Let me conclude by thanking you, Mr. President, for giving me this opportunity to speak again on a very appropriate contemporary theme to our shared global need, and I thank the United Nations for one more time being a wonderful host. In fact, our milestone 77th session. May God bless the United Nations of the world, and I thank you all for listening. Thank you, Mr. President. On behalf of the Assembly, I wish to thank the Prime Minister of the Independent State of Papua New Guinea for the statement just made, and I request protocol to escort His Excellency. The Assembly will hear and